welcome at this session that will form our last official session of this module. And uh, I want to immediately give you a, a group activity that's very simple, but it's also very much part of what we're going to do tonight. And in your groups, two things that I want you to discuss in the group. The one is a testimony, if you have one, about any person that you could influence in the past years, not this year, but this year and more years, one person that you could influence in such a way that that person turned to God, to Jesus, because of your testimony. Um, if you don't have a testimony like that, then you just say, I'm still working on that. Um, but if you have 50 of those testimonies, take the best one. And uh, just one feedback testimony about the person's life that has been changed because of your testimony, or your life, your influence, your ministry. Uh, and some of you have touched many, many lives, and some of you are still working to get your first one. Um, but just try to testify that. And then, second question is, um, how do you feel about people out there that's going to hell? people that's lost do you do you see yourself as part of reaching them winning them touching them or do you don't you feel that's for you i want you just to respond in a group just talk a little bit about your feeling about all the lost out there there's millions and even billions of people on their way to hell how do you feel about them or will you say, the hell with them? <laughs> Let them go to hell, as long as you go to heaven. Uh, how, what's your feeling about them, your passion about them, if you have any passion? And what would you like to see happening about the lost world out there? Just share your, your passion, or your feelings, or your opinions. You know, there's people you, you find that say, man, People deserve to go to hell, so it's fine. Let them go to hell. And um, so what is your feeling about that? So in a group, after that, two people in the group just pray for tonight's session. We're going to talk about uh, discipling nations and touching the world and how God actually wants to do that. So the questions in the group, well, it's preparation of what God has called us for. And uh, we're going to try to answer the solution to this world. What is the solution to this world? All right, you can go on immediately in the group. So uh, two people pray for, for tonight and for you at the end. So discuss that and have some good time. Welcome back. Let's pray. Father God, we just come into your presence because we are your sons. We have the right to be with you. And we have the privilege to live in your presence. And you've promised as we draw unto you, you draw unto us. And Lord, we love to be in your presence. We love to be just where you are. We love to hear your voice and to grow with you. And our greatest desire, Lord, is to become like you and to do the works that you have done upon this earth, to do the same things and even greater. We do not want to miss out on your purpose and desire for our lives. We want to be in exact place and timing and order in terms of your desire for us. Therefore, we pray tonight, Father, that you come through the mighty work of your Holy Spirit and that your Spirit come and indwell us freshly again, we invite you, Spirit of God, Holy Spirit, Spirit of wisdom and counsel and understanding, come and, and help us to understand and hear the Word of God. Help us to understand the season that we are living in. 
Help us to interpret the desires of our Father that we can do the right things and obey the principles of heaven here on earth. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, as our teacher, the revealer of truth. Thank you for giving us new passion. We want to be like you. We want to feel about this world like you. Lord, therefore, you need to change us, and we, we are ready to be changed. We are giving ourselves and say, Lord, change me as I prepare and give myself back to you. Change my heart, O Lord, that it becomes like you, that my heart will be, have the passion and the, 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 uh, um, the, the compassion for people as you have it and had it when you sent your son. We welcome you now, Father, Jesus Christ, the head of our church. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, our minister, friend, counselor. We receive your word in this place and for everyone that's listening. We love you dearly. We appreciate you. We worship you. Honor you. Amen. This session is very much focus on our calling and our ability to, to touch the world out there. You know, part of being upon this earth is not just to yourself to be saved and go to a place called heaven, because actually that's not your first purpose here on earth, is, to, is not to go away. Jesus prayed in John 17, he said, Father, those who are going to believe in me, I don't ask you that you don't ask you to take them away. I ask you to, pr- to protect them from the evil one. So Jesus does not pray that we must fly away or get away. He pray that we will be strong against the evil one, that we can do what we are called for. And then he said, Lord, make them one so that your glory can come upon them. And, and in that whole prayer of Jesus is about glory that comes here, unity that comes here, so that we can change the world. It says, as they become one, so that they can believe that you have sent me, and that, that I am, that Jesus is the, the salvation. So the world must see the salvation in us, our unity, our love, in, in a calling that we have. So we are here on earth for more than just to be saved. We are here actually to save others. And we are extensions of heaven to save people. Now, we are not the salvation in self. We are carrying salvation. And the one we are carrying inside is called Jesus Christ. We are carrying the salvation to each one who will receive him. And those who receive him might receive life. You and me, we are carriers of salvation. And whoever open their heart we give them salvation. That's eternal life, the fullness of God in you now, the abundance of God in your spirit, soul, body, relationship, finance, now. That's salvation. And we are carriers of salvation to anyone who will receive. And therefore, we have a tremendous calling and, and a responsibility to share this salvation to whoever come our way and already. And you remember a few weeks ago I mentioned the principle of the man of peace. Every place you come, every family, every work situation, there's a man of peace. That's a person who are ready for what God wants to do. And when you go on holiday and you're among people, there's a man of peace among them. When you go and sit and there's 50 family members at the party, there's a man of peace among them. Someone who's ready for truth to receive. So you must always be ready to see, Lord, where's that one that you want me to connect to? Because there's someone who will receive what's in you. If you can just identify them, connect to them, give them food, cake, love, acceptance, and then they will receive the one inside of you also. And uh, we are called to, be, to have an influence. There's nothing as great to help someone receive the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that angels in heaven celebrate 
when there's one person who accepts the Lord. They have a big party for every single person who makes a choice. And maybe we have forgot about that. You heard about someone who became a Christian and you sort of, you know, great stuff. You heard there's another 10 people there and there's a 1,000 people there. And I mean, the angels are parting. And we, mm, we think about, you know, I have to pay my bill. I have to do this, you know. But we don't have the perceptive of the perspective of God. We don't look at the world from the eyes of Jesus, desiring to see people's lives change. We are so selfish, busy with ourselves. If I can just survive another week, it will be great. And God's calling for us is far greater than just you to survive, or even to have a nice life. We are here to change the world, to influence people, actually, indirectly, save people. Now, I've started with the scripture I've used previous week also, and that's Matthew 28. This is the main scripture in the Bible. That's the main command for the church to move. And this scripture is actually our commanding orders. This was the scripture, this is the word that Jesus gave before he ascended in heaven. Go. So, without this Verse, the church has no command. We are going nowhere. But this is our purpose. This is our focus. We need to take this scripture apart and understand what it means and to do that. So this scripture says, And coming up, Jesus talked with them, saying, All authority in heaven and earth was given to me. Going then, or that Greek word can also be translated, while you're going or on the going, disciple all nations. So, if I can just dissect that, take it a little bit apart. While you're going in your work situation, while you're building, while you're typing, while you sell stuff to someone, on your going, make disciples of nations or make the nations a disciple of Jesus. So the calling is to nations and those inside of nations while we go. So some people think this going is... You need to be called from South Africa. And God says, you know, you must go to China. Now you go and make disciples in China. No, no, you're always going. You are on your go. And wherever you are in your work situation, you are going. Some of us, and the important thing, your your work must become your mission. Wherever you live and what you do must be part of your mission. And that's the great thing. If you know that the job that you have is being given by God, that means you are called, and that's your place of going. So while you're going in that place where you are, you are there to make disciples. You know, some of us thought, no, God must, I must let go of all work, and I must work for God without money. That's being missions. And that's an old lie. People think if they, they call it, I, I, li- I live by faith. You know what that means? I suffer with nothing. I live by faith. I have nothing. No one cares about me, but I'm living for Jesus. They say, I'm lived by faith. Actually, it's not faith. If you really live by faith, you ha- will have abundance. You will have an income. If you, you live by faith, doors will open up and favor will be upon you. That's real faith. But if nothing happens, you have nothing, and you are falling apart, that's not living by faith. That's living by non-faith. Somewhere you are missing it because God wants to open supply and provision and favor in your life. So on your going, disciple all nations. Now we're going to look into that word disciple just now again. Baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And again, I want to repeat what I said last week. This scripture is not per se, number one, about baptizing people in water. And we are very positive about baptizing people in water. There's a multitude of scriptures that command us that when people accept Jesus, 
we have to baptize them in water. And that's the identification of Christ's death and resurrection. So that's not negotiable. Repent and be baptized in water and you will be filled with the Holy Spirit. So that must happen. That's been said well. But this scripture does not necessarily speak about water baptism. This is a deeper dimension. If you want to see water baptism in this, it's fine. It might be a small part of it, but it's actually far greater than water baptism. Baptize them into the Father, into the Son, and into the Holy Spirit. This is a deeper dimension where when I disciple someone, I bring them into a place where I emerge them into the Father. I emerge them into the Son and into the Holy Spirit. I bring them into a place where they are actually totally under, into. And that's what the word baptism means, to go under, to be there, to be totally clothed or covered with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So my purpose in discipling people is to introduce them to the fullness of the Father, the fullness of Jesus Christ, and the fullness of the Holy Spirit. So your discipling process, just, I mean, on the go, disciple people, and then what do I do as a disciple? I baptize them into the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that is not just take them to water and, you know, some churches... Baptize people once in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they bring you out. Now the churches will do it in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, and then some will spot you not. They will christen you. They throw some water on your face. Um, and uh, some do it for babies, some for others. Now I'm not going into that now. The principle here is when we disciple people, we have to bring them into the fullness of the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then he's not finished yet. After you've done it, then he said, now what must you do more? Teaching them to observe all things, whatever I commanded you. So, going, disciple them, baptize them, bring them into the fullness of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now I teach them everything, all things that Jesus commanded. You know, Jesus was preaching from Old Testament right through. And if you read the red in the King James Version, that's the direct words that Jesus said. And that there's hundreds of commands that Jesus said, do this, do this, do this. Teach people every command what Jesus said. So that's why we come on Sundays, on Wednesday nights, when we receive word. It's all about teaching you the doctrines or the teachings of Jesus. You need to receive every one of that. It's part of becoming a real disciple. It's part of being baptized in the Father, into the Son, and into the Holy Spirit. So that's a tremendous calling we have. So to make a disciple means, there number one, two, three, and four, you see there are number, to follow Jesus, to do his works, to talk his talk, and become like him. So a disciple is really someone who's following someone else. If I have a disciple, it means someone run after me. Someone wants to be like me. Now, that might be great, but I want you to become like the one inside of me. You become a disciple of him that dwells inside of me, Jesus. So I make disciples according to him that's in me. So you must start looking like him as I am starting to look like him. Jesus invested three years in 12 men to make true disciples of them. That always amazed me so much. That in three years, basically 24 hours per day, Jesus spent with these people. And I felt, Lord, how can I do this? I would love to, to see you guys two hours a day, not 24. Just imagine what we can do if we are two hours per day together. But, I mean, we don't even have about two hours per week. How can I disciple you? Like I said last week, three years of Jesus, if you divide the hours approximately in our lifetime, it will take between 70 and 80 years for me to teach you the same things that Jesus did in three years in the amount that I see you only on a Sunday and maybe in the middle of the week. I mean, that's, 
too slow. We can't wait 80 years to make you a mature disciple. So somehow we need to accelerate this. And I know the Holy Spirit helps us, that we accelerate it. When I have you for an hour or two, we, we actually do a lot of impartation in your life and change you to become a disciple. Now, a lot of that happened in our fellowship and our togetherness. Now, number three, I've already emphasized that, baptizing disciples into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to do all things I commanded you, Jesus said. Number five, passion for people. Now, I'm asking this question. It was also in the groups being discussed. That what type of passion do you have for people? I must tell you that most of us, most of the people I know, I mean good Christians, have very little passion for people. Um, we might have a little bit. You know, if I like you, if you are not too difficult, and you will come to me, you make it easy on me, I will give you the gospel. You know, you, you must make it easy on me. Um, but I don't want to... You know, Paul said he, he slept outside. He was drowned nearly twice in the sea. He received, what, eight times, nine times. Uh, lashes on his back. He was stoned, I think, three times to live for death. And he was abused and rejected. We said, no, 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 no. Uh, my life is too comfortable. I don't want to go there. I don't want to sleep on the floor. I don't want to feel uncomfortable working for Jesus. It must be very easy. Otherwise, I don't want to do it. That's how our mind's operating. Don't say you are like that, but we all tend to be like that. Now, Isaiah 61 verse 1, you should know that scripture that says that for, about Jesus and now about us, the Lord has anointed you to preach the good news to the poor, uh, to heal the broken heart, to, uh, you know, and then it continues about uh, deliverance for those who are captive, those who are uh, um, uh, bound or in chains, to open the blind eyes, and it continues in terms of proclaiming the year of God's favor and so on. Now, that's the anointing that God is placing on us because of Christ in you, the anointed one. So on you, there's anointed anointing to preach good news to the poor. That means, I mean, everyone out there is poor. Even while they have money, they are poor because poor poverty is a mindset. It's a lifestyle of not having what God wants to give you. So we have good news for the poor. We can heal broken hearts. The anointing is upon you to heal every broken heart that God brings on your way. So we have that anointing. We have the anointing to bring deliverance to those who are captive and who are bound up in demonic things. We bring deliverance, and we have it. You have it. All of you have it. We are there to open blind eyes in a spirit and physical. Most people are blind. They don't see what God wants for them. I mean, that's spiritual blind eyes, and so on. We are anointed for our task. In John 3, 16, that you also know very well, what does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his son. Now, something that struck me years ago, God so loved the world that he gave his son. And the Lord says, are you prepared to have the same attitude? You want to be like God? God loved this world so much that he gave. Sorrel, do you love this world so much that you are prepared to give your life for this world? That you're prepared to give everything to gain the world? To win one person or a thousand people? Are you prepared to give your life for the purposes of God? God so much loved this world that he gave. And I really pray that, that the Holy Spirit help you to receive this. Because it needs to move you from the place of just being comfortable and, you know, watching your grass grow to a place where you are concerned about your neighbors. And that you are involved in, in caring for people. And that you really care about and pray for people that you know that lives are not right. That you will, will develop a passion like God has. And that Jesus came and showed us a passion for people. Now I want to read you Luke 15. And then you can ask yourself whether you think you have this kind of passion. Luke 15. If you have a Bible, you can page with me. I want to read a few verses there in Luke 15. 
Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him, that's Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, the man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now you have to hear this. This is where it starts. This is the key. This man, Jesus, welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now the question is, are people saying that about you? Or are you too high and mighty to mess yourself up with sinners? Jesus was continuously among the sinners, the tax collectors, the outies. And he was in the bar on the pavement where they gamble. Jesus was there. He did not participate in their sin, but he was there to share love and for them to identify with him. That's, that's why they said he's a, he's a drunkard. They actually said it about Jesus. He's a drunkard and he, he associates with sinners. Now, now Jesus explained why he's among sinners. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulder and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and say, Rejoice with me, I found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need repentance. So now it's one sheep who got lost, and they celebrate about one. And now Jesus felt this is not good enough. He's going to repeat the same thing three times for us to understand how important is one person for God. Again, he says, Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, finds it she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there will be rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. As if this was not good enough, Jesus is telling the third parable. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided the property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had set off for a distant country. And there he squatted the wealth and well living. You know this prodigal son story. So he spent everything. He ended up with the pigs and eventually... Verse 17, when he came to his senses, he said, so actually he came to a place of repentance. How many of my father's hired men have food to spare and here I am starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. So that is a place of repentance where you can say, don't give me, but make me. And this is when you see real repentance, when someone comes to a place not to say, Lord, what is my ministry? You know, give me. You come to the Lord and say, Lord, make me anything you want. Whatever you want to use me for, I'm ready to serve you. I will do whatever. You're not there to take you, there to give yourself. And so the story continues about the son who came back, and then the eldest son, you'll remember that oldest son who was complaining, and we, we can preach on that, a lot of that, because all churches, and even my congregation, uh, has some of these older sons that's sitting in the outside complaining about the party that's going on in the inside. So he called one of his servants, uh, let's go, uh, verse 31, my son, The father said, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because the brother of yours was dead. He's alive again. He was lost and he's found. Now, Jesus told the same kind of parable three times. Why? To explain why he was among the sinners. Why he was spending time with broken people. 
addicted people, confusing people. And, uh, and we need to ask ourselves that thing, you know, did we develop to a place where all your friends are just most holy ones? Or are you mixing with people, I mean, sensitively, you're mixing with people with the purpose of seeing where is the man of peace, someone I can touch for God. You know, you can be at work and go to work, and every tea time you go there, take it your Bible, sit and read Bible. And everyone will check you and say, oh, one of those. And they said, come party with us afterwards. She said, no, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't dance, I don't live. <laughs> and they, and they, they will write you off because you're actually, in their eyes, you are useless. You're so heavenly minded, you have no earthly use. <clears throat> now, what will happen if you are there at work and they're playing ping pong table tennis and you go and join them? And you win them all. And you make friends with them. Even while they hang on their skaver and they tell their stories, you're there to influence. You're there to testify. Not to become like them, but to win them. You know, and all of life is about this. Always you're there to influence. Lord, show me where I can influence. Show me who I can win. I'm not prepared to let go of what I have. But Paul says, for the Romans, I become like a Roman. For the Jews, like the Jews. Um, and therefore, in situations, you identify with people in what they are, with the purpose to win them where they are, and bring them back to where you are. So in your spirit, you never move from your position. But in your flesh, you identify with those people where they are. Not to become like them, because then you are immature. You are there to bring them sensitively back to where you are. And that's a great calling that's upon us. In Luke 19 verse 41, Jesus was overlooking Jerusalem. What was Jesus doing as he looked over Jerusalem? He started crying. He said, oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And he was crying over a city. Let's ask the question for you and me. Have you cried over your city yet? Have you cried over your family yet? The lost ones? Have you experienced the passion of God for people, for a nation? It's all about where God is calling you. I don't want you to stand and cry every day over the city. But there's a place where God has called you. In a moment, you pray for those people. You sense the compassion of God for those people. And when you sense God's compassion... You feel like crying for them. And it's not, I mean, we don't change the city by crying for the city. That's not the point here. We change the city by having compassion and do something with the compassion I have. And compassion is what Jesus said. He had compassion of the, on the blind, on the poor, on the old. He had compassion and he moved in and changed the circumstances. Heal them, deliver them, preach to them, give them good news. He had compassion upon them. So we pray it, and I pray it for you. Lord, give us compassion for what you are called for. I don't want you to have compassion for everything, but compassion specifically in the area that God has called you for. And maybe you don't have any feelings for a certain group of people or certain age of people. Maybe you don't have compassion for old people or for children, but God gives you compassion for a certain group of people. And that's your calling. You love that. You enjoy that. You can pour your heart out into that area of ministry. Maybe you love children, but you are not so easy on old people. Or other way around. Or, you know, what God has called you for, he will give you a compassion for couples. I have a great compassion for families, for married couples. I enjoy it so much. I've seen the past months. Every time I minister to couples and Work. There's such a lot of compassion. And, and this last week I've been involved with leaders in a church, pastors, that, that their children are killed themselves, suicidal things that happen, you know, in pastors' homes. And I thought, wow, you know, 
what's going wrong? You know, there's so many families falling apart. And my heart is going out to, to this condition because that's part of my compassion is flowing into families and the state of families and heal and restore them. Now, God is giving a passion and a compassion for you towards the calling that he has placed upon you. If it's in the business area, he will give you a compassion and a passion for that. And you will care about them and being involved and do something. So allow the Holy Spirit to bring a passion in you that will turn into a compassion for that thing. So that you, compassion means it moves you into that area. It moves you to change it. It moves you to get involved in, in that area of calling. Then quickly I want to take you to the story of Jonah. Jonah in the Old Testament. I can't read everything. There's four chapters, but it's just amazing. This guy, Jonah, who was called. Just, just see this guy as if it's you, you yourself. Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Just, just imagine you get a word like that. You know, I, I call you forward and prophesy over you. And I said, God says, I want you to go to Maputo. And I want you to go and tell the city of Maputo that God is against the city of evil. He's going to destroy it. That's your job. Go. <laughs> so instead of going to Maputo, you take the taxi to Namibia. <clears throat> There's no boat that's going that direction. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarsus. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for the port. After paying the ferry, he went aboard and sailed to Tarsus to flee from the Lord. Now, Tarsus was opposite direction of where he was supposed to go. I mean, he had to go inland to, to the city, and now he went to the sea and went into the middle, the Mediterranean Sea, to a totally 180 degrees opposite direction. So now the whole story, you know, you remember that story. Now it's on the boat, and now the storm came. And the people on the boat, they were not believers, but they said, you know, something is wrong. Some of you are cursed on this thing, and that you're, you, you are bringing this storm upon us. And eventually, Jonah was hiding in the bottom, but he came out and said, all right, I'm the culprit here. God, God is, will kill us all if I don't repent, or I'm guilty. Throw me out into the sea. Eventually, they did that. They threw him out. And the moment when they threw him out, the sea calmed down. So they got their answer. And they actually, after that, if you read that, they worshipped the God of Jonah because of his intervention. So here, God sent a big fish. We're not sure which one it was. A big fish swallowing him, and then you can read uh, how Jonah was praying in the fish. He said, the grass, sea grasses around my head. I'm, um, you know, imagine in that fish stomach, all the dead fish around you, his previous, his breakfast and everything that's there off, um, eaten and uh, smells and so on. And maybe there was a little bubble in there and in the bubble he had some oxygen and he was calling out and he was calling. You will call in there. I, I promise you. You don't pray, oh Lord, you know, uh, you don't pray little prayers there. You call, you scream, you cry, you do anything to move God. I mean, that's actually how we should pray every day. Don't wait for being in the stomach of the fish. So he called out to God, and God heard his prayer and commanded the fish to spit him out. So the fish spit him out. That was chapter 1. Chapter 2. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed. That was, all right, chapter 2. He called to the Lord and so on and so on. Chapter 3. When the word of the Lord, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh, proclaim to it the message I give you. So Jonah obeyed. So at least he moved now. But you know, you know that, that joke of the teacher who said to little Yanni, Yanni, sit. Yanni said, I will not sit, I will stay. Teacher said, Yanni, sit. If you don't sit, I will hit you. And Yanni said, I will not. And, 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 and teacher said, I'm counting to three. If you don't sit, I'm going to hit you. So Yanni went and sat. He said, outside I'm sitting, but inside I'm standing. 
Uh, that's the opposite of submission. You know, submission is a willing heart. It's not just what you do on the outside. It's your heart. Now, Jonah was like Yanni. He was still standing, although he submitted. And he went to Nineveh, but he didn't like it. He didn't accept that this is God's calling. He didn't like it, but he went there. Otherwise, he's going to end up in another fish again. So he was not prepared to, to go through that again. How stupid you can be. But here he goes. So he went into the city and preached. That's all chapter 3. He was preaching and telling the people that God is going to destroy this city. Um, and instead of the people ignoring him, all the people fell on their knees and starting to confess their sins. Even the king. Everything the king announced, everyone must go in the fast. Even the animals may not drink or eat. Everyone must fast so that God will not destroy us. Now Jonah become very angry. These people are actually listening to his sermon. I mean, he went to preach, but he did not ex expect them to repent. That's how many pastors are preaching. We preach, but we don't expect that people will respond, you know. We're actually amazed if they listen. <laughs> We're amazed if anyone accepts the Lord or any healing happens. Wow, I didn't expect that to happen. Now verse chapter 4. But Jonah was greatly displeased and become angry. Became angry. He prayed to the Lord. Oh Lord, is it not that I said when I was still at home that that is why I was so quick to flee to Tarsus. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Wow. How can you complain about God's grace and mercy? He wants to see, he was looking forward to see fire fall. Destruction. He wants to see the people die and being destroyed. And here God is operating in mercy and grace. And now he's, he said, yeah, that is just what I thought is going to happen. You always, you have too much grace. You're slow to anger. You said you will kill us, but you never do it. And now what? Please kill me, he says. I don't want to be alive. I can't face the mercy. Kill me. <laughs> How stupid can you be? <laughs> I want you just to pick up on, on the flow of grace and God's compassion for people. Just a little bit of repentance and God was ready to forgive them. God is looking for repentance for people to change. But he's looking for someone who will speak the word. Who is ready to carry the word. And then the whole chapter finished, you know, as Jonah went out and sat there, looked back, and he was upset, and he wanted to die. And uh, an old story, God allowed a tree to grow over him for his shadow, and the next day the tree was dead, eaten by a worm. And then he com complains about the tree. He said, you gave me a tree, now you take it away again. I mean, this is <laughs> so typical us, <laughs> complaining about the mercy of God. As if we have the right to everything. May God change our hearts with compassion to this world and to people. Now, let's take a break quickly, and then we're going to do the last portion.